Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, or good morning or good evening, as the case may be, wherever you are. I'm John Fazio, and I am talking to you from uh, Fairlawn, Ohio, which uh, some of you may know is a suburb of Akron, Ohio, which I'm sure most of you know is about 40 miles south of Cleveland. Let me say that it's my great pleasure to be among you today and to have the privilege of addressing you. I'm going to speak to you about the black flag, the black flag and its relevance to the events of April 14th, 1865. The great English novelist Thomas Hardy once said that uh, truth like a bastard comes into the world never without ill fame to him or her who gives her birth. And George Bernard Shaw added, the great uh, Irish playwright, of course, added that all great truths begin as blasphemies. It is my purpose and intention today to speak the truth as I perceive it, as I interpret it, as I understand it. And let the consequences be what they will be. If we as historians, scholars, and writers are not enthralled to truth, then I say to you with great respect that we should find something else to do. Black flag warfare is broadly defined as warfare without law or convention in which no atrocity is unacceptable, no quarter is asked for or given, no prisoners are taken and anything goes. Black flag warfare is evil, which means we're all capable of it because we are all capable of evil and good. Unlike uh, many other animals, such as dogs, for example, we humans are all the same species, homo sapiens. Differences of race, ethnicity, nationality, religion are superficial coverings like clothes. They give us superficial identities. Underneath these superficial identities, we are all the same animal. And no people is exceptional, not even us. American excep exceptionalism is a myth. We all do what we have to do to survive. That is the first law of nature, self-preservation. Whatever our enemies have done and that we have rightly decried and condemned, we have also done, including slavery and genocide. Because we are all the same animal, we all have the same nature, which we naturally refer to as human nature, which is universal, and immutable. But human behavior, as we all know, is infinitely variable. The two are often confused, but they must not be. Whether we manifest good or evil depends entirely on one variable, which, however, has infinite dimensions. And that, of course, is circumstance, including climate, geography, historical happenstance, and our innate constitutions. I am I and my circumstances, said the great Spanish philosopher, Jose Ortega y Gasso. And you see a photo of him there. Black flare warfare is waged in, uh, in virtually all wars. It begins with the first atrocity, which initiates a cycle of retaliation, which doesn't end until the war does. And sometimes not even then. When the cycle begins, Man's inhumanity to man is without limit. The pages of history are soaked with the blood and littered with the bones of the victims of the black flag. And if the pages could speak, they would assail our ears with the victim's screams. And let there be no mistake, there is no difference, none at all, in the records of the ancient medieval and modern worlds. We are just as vicious, brutal, sadistic, savage, and barbarous now as we have ever been. Indeed, the black flag is older than the historical record. There is solid evidence of massacres that occurred tens of thousands of years ago when we were still hunting and gathering. And here are two photos of excavated, excavated remains from that age. There is one, note the binding at the wrists. This is over 10,000 years old. And here is another. 
We note the gaping mouths, note the binding at the wrists. We can hardly imagine the pain and the agony and the suffering that these unfortunates endured before death mercifully overtook them. The, method, the means and methods of, of torturing and killing enemies are many and horrible. It will avail us nothing to see pictures of the same so-called machines of malice and torture. We've all seen and heard of them, the Iron Maiden, the rack, the wheel, the screw, the press, and many more diabolical devices for inflicting maximum pain and suffering and ultimately death. But let us look at one method that has found favor throughout the ages, and that is impaling. And I have here three illustrations of impaling. The one on the left is from the ancient world. The one uh, uh, in the middle, actually the one here on the right too, is, is also from the ancient world as Assyrians. That one is uh, from the uh, early Middle Ages, the period of the Crusades. And uh, this one uh, is uh, Vlad the Impaler, very famous uh, 15th century uh, king, Eastern European king, Vlad the Impaler. That was his, what he was called. He's calmly having a lunch or a dinner here while his impaled victims uh, surround him. And here are three illustrations of how the Spaniards managed to reduce the indigenous Indian population in, new, in the New World from an estimated 100 million in 1500 to an estimated 12 million in 1600, which is to say one century. Uh, they uh, hang them and they also burn them. They're being hanged and burned. And here they burn them. And uh, here they infected them with uh, fatal diseases. And here closer to our own time are photos of a Japanese atrocity in Nanking, China in 1937 and 1938. Here is an American atrocity at My Lai in Vietnam in 1968. And here is a German atrocity that we are all familiar with. Religion is no break. It is no deterrent, as it is often thought and said to be. Violation of religious precepts is something which we purport to honor, is something we do every day. In all of human history, there is nothing as pervasive as religious hypocrisy. It is war's second casualty after truth. But let me be clear. I have said that religion is not a deterrent, and that is true. But neither is it an accelerant, as it is often also thought and said to be, usually by those who spend too much time, energy, and money attacking this biological phenomenon, which is in our brain chemistry, put there by eons of struggle for survival against predators, against our own kind, against cousins, against the elements and against the whims of nature and the awful finality of death and the consequent need for help. Uh, they might just as well with as much chance of success attack eating, drinking, sleeping and procreating. The great German scholar and historian Oswald Spengler put the matter directly. He said, no faith has yet altered the world and no fact can ever rebut a faith. I hasten to add that secular authority has done no better than religious authority. The two great atheistic experiments of the 20th century were abysmal and colossal failures. The first, the Soviet Union, which matured under Joseph Stalin, a mass murderer, collapsed after all of 74 years in a heap of religious resurgence and environmental pollution. The second, the People's Republic of China matured under Mao Zedong, that man, and another mass murderer, and is still going, but is communist in name only, its government having long ago consigned its Marxist-Leninist ideology to the dustbin of history and embraced the global economy with a fervor equal to or exceeding anyone else's embrace. 
it too is experiencing a religious resurgence. Quote, the victory of reason over faith has to be won over and over again, unquote, said Will Durant, that man. Well, if a no religion has yet altered the world, nor deterred war, including black flag war, and secularism has done no better, then what are we to do? The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings, said Shakespeare and Julius Caesar. And Pogo, Walt Kelly's creation said the same thing, but with a bit more color. He said, we have met the enemy and he is us. And Count Axel Oxenstierna, the Lord High Chancellor of Sweden in the 17th century, in speaking to his son, put it this way. Do you not know, my son, with how little wisdom the world is government, governed? Recent arrivals in our world look about them and see wrongdoing, falsehood, and injustice everywhere and, and imagine that they can do something about it in the long term. That is why we have revolutions, which are always made by young people, including our own. Such an example was the Russian Revolution of 1917, which Vladimir Lenin assured us was going to change human nature overnight, or perhaps in two or three generations, no more, after which, after which each citizen would give according to his work and receive according to his needs. Money would be eliminated and replaced by a voucher system. The government of people would be replaced by the administration of things and the state would wither away. The reality, however, is that the revolution not only failed to create anything even remotely like such a society, but a century later has given us instead a country governed by thugs and kleptocrats. Only youth knows better than a thousand years. Durant again. Because of time constraints, I'm going to touch very lightly on the Indian Wars. A massacre is defined as the slaughter of substantial numbers of disarmed combatants, including prisoners of war and civilians. There were 177 recorded massacres of Indians by whites and some of whites by Indians in America from 1539 through 1911. And doubtless, there were many more that simply went unrecorded. All are characterized by unbelievable brutality, cruelty, killing, and mutilation, including dismemberment and desecration of corpses. I'm going to mention only one because it is close to me emotionally as well as geographically. And that is the massacre in 1782 of 96 Moravian Delaware Indians who had converted to Christianity incidentally at the missionary settlement of Gnadenhutten, Ohio, which is about 65 miles south of Cleveland. They were looking for food. While they were so doing, they encountered uh, a contingent of American militia moving west into Ohio from Western Pennsylvania. These uh, militia had encountered uh, uh, Indians in Western Pennsylvania. They had taken casualties and therefore they were not in a particularly good frame of mind toward Indians asked by the American militia to show their good faith by surrendering their arms, the Indians did so, and then were promptly bound and made to sit on benches in a meeting house, and then all of them but two little boys had their brains bashed out, uh, several militiamen uh, uh, taking turns with a cooper's mallet for the purpose. There is there today a reconstructed uh, uh, meeting house uh, a monument that memorializes the event and an earthen mound that is said to contain the remains of the 96 Indians, but without their brains. And there they are being massacred. Now let us turn to our own national fratricide. The black flag was raised early, even before the war with the murder of Elijah Parrish Lovejoy, that man, an Illinoisan transplanted from Maine a clergyman, a fervent abolitionist who published an anti-slavery newspaper, first in St. Louis and later in Alton, Illinois. When uh, his pro-slavery enemies couldn't silence him by intimidation and threats to him and his family, uh, and by throwing his presses into the Mississippi, they murdered him. 
and an associate on November 7th, 1837. Lovejoy has been called the first casualty of the Civil War. And that is the uh, building in which they were murdered. The Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854 made slavery a local option in the territories of Kansas and Nebraska. But the locomotive of history was not about to be derailed by ill-conceived half measures, however prettified. The result was civil war in Kansas, which became known as Bleeding Kansas, as anti-slavery and pro-slavery elements poured into the area to claim it for either free soil or slavery. Atrocities followed like night followed day. Night follows day. There were barn burnings, horse stealings, and shootings. On May 21st, 1856, the town of Lawrence, Kansas, uh, identified with free soilers, was sacked by a pro-slavery mob. In retaliation, John Brown, that fellow, a fanatic abolitionist, and uh, some of his followers hacked to death. Five Southern settlers near Pottawatomie Creek on May 24th. Brown had counterparts. One was Benjamin Franklin Stringfellow, that fellow, a Virginian of high, and a high-ranking border ruffian, a fire-eating hater of blacks, a defender of slavery, and a proponent of secession. He is not to be confused with the Benjamin Franklin Stringfellow, who was a Confederate Secret Service agent uh, of the same name. We will get to him later. In an 1855 speech in St. Joseph, Missouri, this string fellow said, quote, I tell you to mark every scoundrel that is in the least tainted with free soilism or abolitionism and exterminate them. Neither give nor take quarter from the damned rascals. After Fort Sumter, the black flag was taken to a higher level, including the following. Captives were often killed in cold blood, beheaded, buried alive, impaled to the ground with stakes through their throats or other parts of their bodies, had their genitals severed and placed where nature did not intend them to be. A common practice in war, incidentally, because it is considered the ultimate degradation. It appears in the records of nearly all wars. And or they had their eyes gouged or plucked out. But it also meant one prisoner of war camps where the inmates died like flies from filthy water insufficient and contaminated food, brutality and exposure. You see an example of it right there. Here's another. In one summer, uh, 1864, 16,000 Union prisoners of war died at Andersonville, otherwise known as Camp Sumter in Georgia, according to testimony that was introduced at the trial of the Lincoln conspirators in 1865. The commander, Henry Wirtz, there's still another, Another photo of uh, an inmate in Andersonville, and there is still another. Does uh, Auschwitz have anything on these guys, on this place? The commander, Henry Wirtz, that man, was the only Confederate officer hanged after the war. Summary execution of black prisoners of war. It was standard practice for Confederate captives to summarily execute black captives rather than take them prisoner. The policy was initially approved without reservation by President Jefferson Davis and Secretary of War uh, James Seddon. Later, the initial approval was uh, modified somewhat by Davis, there is Seddon, uh, who ordered that these uh, slaves, the blacks, I should say, be returned to the states to which they belonged. This was merely window dressing because returning to, to the states to which they belong meant certain death by hanging. In truth, very few were returned. They were almost all shot on the spot or hanged upon capture, and as often as not, mutilated. Massacres, including Fort Pillow, Tennessee, April 12th, 1864, where Confederate forces under this man, General Nathan Bedford Forrest, killed all the black troops on duty at Fort Pillow. A federal congressional investigating committee later confirmed that more than 300 blacks, including women and children, had been summarily murdered after the fort had surrendered. About 100 whites were also murdered. Saltville, Virginia. Saltville is a small town in southwestern Virginia. On October 2nd, 1864, Confederate forces overwhelmed Union troops there. 
The next day, they killed in cold blood 46 wounded black soldiers. The notorious guerrilla Champ Ferguson, that fellow, calmly walked about the battle site after the fighting, killing both white and black prisoners. Confederate, a Confederate captain wrote in his diary, quote, the continual singing of the rifle sung the death knell of many a poor Negro who was unfortunate enough not to be killed yesterday. Our men took no prisoners. Ferguson was fond of decapitating his enemies and rolling their heads down the hillside. After the war, he was tried for 53 cold-blooded murders. He said it was a lie that he had actually killed 120. He was, of course, convicted and hanged. Lawrence, Kansas again. On August 21st, 1863, Lawrence was sacked again, this time by William Clark Quantrill and his raiders. There is Quantrill, the Casper Milktoast looking Quantrill a former school teacher, school teacher had 185 to 200 men and boys of the town lined up and shot dead, all of them. Shelton Laurel, North Carolina. Confederate troops marched 15 Union captives from North Carolina to Eastern Tennessee. After the two escaped, the other 13, including three boys ages 13, 14, and 17, were taken into the woods and shot in cold blood. This happened on or about January 18th, 1863. Baxter Springs, Kansas. On October 6th, 1863, Quantrill caught about 100 Union troops in the open. He killed 85 outright. The slaughter was described this way by one participant, quote, in many instances where the soldiers were pursued, they were told that if they surrendered, they would be treated as prisoners of war. But in every case, the moment they surrendered and were disarmed, they were shot down, sometimes even with their own arms in the hands of the bandits, unquote. Centralia, Missouri, Confederate guerrilla, Bloody Bill Anderson, that man, was a psychopathic killer and rapist. He and about 80 of his men swarmed over a train they had blocked in Centralia on September 27th, 1864. Among the 125 passengers, were 23 Union soldiers returning from the Battle of Atlanta. Anderson ordered that they be stripped and then shot 22 of them to death, sparing one officer for prisoner exchange. Anderson was killed uh, in October, 1864 at the ripe age of 24 or 25. The Nusus River, Texas, this was a massacre of German Texans on August 10th, 1862. They were pro-Union and anti-slavery. 65 of them fled from Mexico. Texas Confederate cavalrymen gave chase and overtook them at night while they were resting. They slew 34 outright at the Nusus River near Corpus Christi. Some of the 34 were executed after they were taken prisoner. The burning of Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. On July 30th, 1864, Confederate cavalry under, under the general command of Jubal Early rode into Chambersburg. And when the city fathers couldn't raise the money demanded of them, they put the city to the torch and about two thirds of it was destroyed. There you see Chambersburg after the uh, fire. The burning of Atlanta. Atlanta fell to William Tecumseh Sherman on September 1st, 1864. Um, inasmuch as uh, he, Sherman, had complete control of the city and therefore could quite easily prevent its use for military purposes, there was absolutely no military necessity to destroy Atlanta, but destroy it he did on November 14th. And by the time the flames subsided, between 3,200 and 5,000 homes and businesses had been reduced to ashes. Sherman's march to the sea. After the burning of Atlanta, Sherman on November 15th, with 62,000 men set forth for the sea and Savannah. He declared that his men would live off the land, a nice euphemism for raping it. His men destroyed industrial facilities, agricultural facilities, railroads, bridges, crops, and livestock. Foragers known as bummers took everything that wasn't nailed down and homes were frequently looted. The depredations on the march had one lasting result, a state full of Georgians consumed by a bitterness and hatred that has not fully abated to this day. The burning of Columbia, South Carolina. Sherman's 60,000 man army captured Columbia 
on February 17, 1865. As night fell, the dark sky was slowly and unnaturally illuminated with a redness that portended evil and the air became barely breathable. Soon almost the entire city of 12,000 to 14,000 people was aflame. Sherman tried to place the blame elsewhere, but under the well-recognized common law principle of respondeat superior, the blame was his because he failed to control his troops. The spoliation of the Shenandoah Valley. The Shenandoah Valley may just be the most beautiful piece of real estate on earth. And that's saying something because there are more breathtaking landscapes and vistas in this world than we can count. The panorama of the rolling Shenandoah River, golden fields, green pastures, dark woodlands, picturesque villages, fertile and well-stocked farms, and the hazy blue-gray mountains that bisect and surround it induces a euphoria rarely experienced and then only by natural wonders. Think of the spoliation of this Eden as a crucifixion. Only the madness of black flag warfare could occasion it and just such insanity did. Because it was a larder for Confederate armies, General Ulysses S. Grant ordered General Phil Sheridan, the gutsy but heartless brat with the ridiculous hat to make all the valley there is with his ridiculous hat to make all the valley south of the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad a desert as high up as possible. Sheridan's co-executioner was General David Hunter, Black Dave, as he was called. And so it was done. The land paid dearly for being a cornucopia. Sheridan's and Hunter's men systematically destroyed the valley's resources. The barbarism consumed uh, virtually all of Augusta, Rockingham, Shenandoah, and Page counties. It, is referred to, it was referred to then, and it is still referred to as the burning. The days were marked by pillars of smoke and the nights by pillars of fire, flames luridly licking the night sky. Anything that could benefit the Confederacy, barns, haystacks, straw stacks, gardens, corn cribs, grist mills, bridges, and livestock, was destroyed. Of course, the destruction and plunder strengthened the resolve of the Confederate leaders, political and military, to have their revenge. A dish, it is said, best taken cold by consigning as many of their tormentors as possible to premature graves. Please keep that fact in mind. Bad as the black flag already was in our war, two incidents occurred in early 1864 that kicked it up to a new level a war totally without conscience. Um, the incidents were raids by Union cavalry against Richmond. They are identified by the names of their leaders. The first was the Wistar raid. The first such raid by Union cavalry was under the command of General Isaac Wistar, that fellow. It took place on February 6th and 7th, 1864 and failed. Wistar was under the command of Major General Benjamin Butler, Benjamin F. Butler. It was Butler's purposes and orders uh, to capture, quote, some of the leaders of the rebellion, unquote. The orders were published in Richmond newspapers. The claim was made that Wistar intended to assassinate President Davis, which wasn't true. But as always, perception is more important than reality. And the perception was that the chief magistrate of the United States, that is to say, Abraham Lincoln, had ordered the death of the chief magistrate of the Confederate States, Jefferson Davis. Please keep that fact in mind. The Dahlgren Kilpatrick raid. The second raid, which took place between February 28th and March 3rd, 1864, was named for Colonel Ulrich Dahlgren, that man, and General H. Judson Kilpatrick, that man, who led it. The raid also failed. This raid also failed. Dahlgren's orders appeared to provide not for the capturing of, quote, some of the leaders of the rebellion, unquote, but for the killing of Davis and his cabinet. Dahlgren was killed. Papers found on his uh, corpse, which now, which were then and are still known as the Dahlgren papers, either contained such orders or the orders were later forged in whole or in part. The con consensus among scholars and historians is that the Dahlgren papers are genuine, but they didn't come from Lincoln. In any case, 
They created a firestorm of rage and controversy, which has not abated to this day. As always, perception was more important than reality. And the perception was that the documents were genuine, that the Yankees were barbarians, and that their agenda, which originated with the tyrant Lincoln, included decapitation of the Confederate government by wholesale assassinations. Confederate leaders therefore proceeded according to those beliefs, beliefs for which the Southern press demanded retribution in kind. Please keep that fact in mind. In the weeks following the raids, Davis and other Confederate leaders, political and military, spent much time in conference discussing appropriate countermeasures. Davis uh, later wrote in his, uh, in his uh, tome, the, uh, the Rise and Fall of the Confederacy, the enormity of Dogman's crimes was not forgotten. What followed was a level of black flag warfare that was higher than that already uh, waged, than that that had already been waged. A higher level included at least the following events and activities. In April, Davis sent Jacob Thompson, that man, from Mississippi, and Clement C. Clay, that man, from Alabama to Canada, with, quote, such instructions as you have received from me verbally in such manner as shall seem most likely to conduce the furtherance of the interests of the Confederate States of America, unquote. They brought with them drafts for 1 million in gold, that's 2.2 million in greenbacks, to carry out uh, their schemes and plans. They joined James P. Holcomb of Virginia, that man, whom Davis had already sent to Canada in February of that year to carry out, quote, duties already entrusted, but not specified in writing, unquote. Now, it does not require a particularly vivid imagination to know why their instructions and duties could not be committed to paper, even in code. That is to say, they must have been odious in the extreme, the kind of orders and instructions that must never see the light of day the kind, therefore, that called for political assassinations and the death of innocents on a massive scale, which they did, as we shall see. Please keep that fact in mind. From Toronto, Thompson, that's Jacob Thompson, orchestrated an attempt to foment a second civil war in the North and thereby split the East from the West, establishing what was known as the Northwest Confederacy. Writing to James Seddon, the Secretary of War, Captain Thomas Henry Hines, that man, the principal player in this scheme, spoke of his plans to seize the governments of Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, and therefore to assassinate their executive heads, John Bruff of Ohio, Oliver P. Morton of Indiana, and Richard Yates of Illinois, as well as all federal, state, and municipal leaders who stood in the way of gaining complete control uh, of those states. Please keep that fact in mind. From Canada, Dr. Luke P. Blackburn, the Joseph Mengele of his day from Kentucky, oversaw a scheme to spread pestilence in the North, principally yellow fever, using quote, infected qu clothing. He didn't know, no one knew, no one would know for 35 years that you couldn't spread yellow fever with clothing, but only by mosquito bites. Godfrey Joseph Hyams, a shoemaker, testified at the trial of the Lincoln conspirators in 1865 that he met regularly with Blackburn and Holcomb and Thompson and Clay, who counseled him with respect to the sale and distribution of, quote, infected clothing. Part of the scheme, said Hyams, involved sending a valise full of, quote, infected shirts to Lincoln as a gift from an anonymous benefactor. The men promised Hyams $100,000 for his services, perhaps 10 times that amount. And they also promised him most significantly that he would become, quote, a gentleman for the future instead of a working man and a mechanic, unquote. They also told him that the Confederate government had appropriated $200,000, that's about 3 million in today's money, for the purpose of carrying out the plan, the scheme, the yellow fever plot, that Davis and therefore Secretary of State Judah Benjamin knew of this plot 
is uh, there is Benjamin, the Secretary of State, is proved by a letter that survived the flames from this man, Episcopalian minister turned Confederate agent Kenzie John Stewart, where Stewart pleads with Davis to desist from the yellow fever plot on the grounds that it could not possibly find favor with God. The letter expressly, the letter expressly mentions Iams, and the interesting thing about it is that it did not dissuade Davis because four months later, the trunks were still full and the plan was still on, according to Hyams. Further and most significantly, Hyams stated that he learned that the infected shirts had in fact been delivered to the White House for President Lincoln. Please keep all of these facts in mind. An event intended to coordinate with Hines' attempt to further divide the United States with his Northwest conspiracy was the voyage of, uh, of this uh, ship the Confederate raider CSS Tallahassee. She was under the command of John Taylor Wood, that man. She sailed from Wilmington, North Carolina on August 6, 1864, through the blockade to Halifax, Nova Scotia, uh, returning to uh, Wilmington on August 26. Uh, en route, Wood uh, captured 35 ships, burned most of them to the waterline and spread panic throughout New York and New England. Wood's ultimate goal was nothing less than the seizure of the state of Maine, coordinating with the Confederate raider CSS Florida and making use of troops from John Hunt Morgan's, Joe Wheeler's and Jeb Stewart's commands who would be brought there by blockade runners and joined by troops from Canada. The plot failed, of course, it was much too ambitious. On August 9th, 1864, Confederate Secret Service agents succeeded in destroying the Union ammunition depot at City Point, Virginia, using a horological torpedo, what we would call a time bomb. Between 60 and 300 people were killed, including a party of laders, ladies, and hundreds more were maimed, in addition to 2 million to 4 million in property loss, an astronomical sum in those days. Jacob Thompson, there is the explosion at City Point, Jacob Thompson ordered this man, John Yates Bell, to carry out acts of terror against the North. They all failed. Bell was arrested, tried, convicted, and on February 8, 1865, sentenced to be hanged. Because he was from a prominent Virginia family, many in high places, including six United States senators and 91 members of Congress, petitioned Lincoln and for a pardon to no avail. He was executed on February 24th, 1865. Davis's and Benjamin's knowledge that this prominent Virginian had gone to his death in their service and following his orders and instructions brought their anger against Lincoln to a fever pitch. Please keep that in mind. On August 9th, 1864, Bennett H. Young led a 20-man force from Canada on a raid of St. Albans, Vermont, 15 miles south of the Canadian border. They did some damage, they robbed some banks, they killed a man, but the raid did not succeed in provoking war between the United States and Great Britain, which was its principal purpose. On the night of November 25th, 1864, Robert Cobb Kennedy, that man, and seven other conspirators set fire to dozens of hotels, theaters, museums, and shopping facilities in New York City. Charles A. Dunham, allegedly a Confederate agent, but possibly a double agent or even a triple agent, testified that the destruction of New York's water supply by blowing up the Croton Dam was considered, as was poisoning of the water supply with strychnine, arsenic, or prussic acid. On November 27, 1864, a coal bomb destroyed General Benjamin F. Butler's luxurious steamer Greyhound almost killing Major Union military figures, Butler, Admiral David Dixon Porter, and Major General Robert C. Shank. Now, I need hardly say that none of the foregoing acts of terror and others uh, that I simply haven't time to discuss, including killing the entire membership of the House of Representatives by throwing a vial of poison from the balcony, uh, including burning of all vessels embarking, uh, embarking from Northern ports, could have been carried out without the knowledge and approval of the highest levels of the Confederate government. Why should it be any different with the crown jewel of the terror campaign, namely decapitation of the United States government by multiple assassinations? 
And so we come to the events of April 14th. We need to answer three questions. What really happened on that night? Was the Confederate leadership ready, willing, and able to carry out multiple assassinations? Did the Confederate leadership have the motivation to do so? With respect to the first question, the answer is that what really happened was not only the assassination of the President of the United States, but an all-out attempt to destroy the United States government, or as much of it as they possibly could, sending multiple assassins against multiple targets. And here is some evidence that supports this thesis. An attempt was made absolute, with absolute certainty, an attempt was made by Secretary of State, against Secretary of State William Seward. Attempts on Johnson, uh, Vice President Johnson, Secretary of War Stanton, and Lieutenant General of the Army's Ulysses S. Grant were almost certainly made. Uh, and attempts on the lives of other federal officers may have been made, but the evidence for these is weak. A letter that came into the excuse me, that came into, these are the five that were targeted for assassination. A letter that came into the Bureau, uh, the possession of the Bureau of Military Justice at that time, dated April 10th, 1865, and addressed to Booth at the National Hotel where he always stayed when he was in Washington. It was signed TIOS and it stated into uh, inter AYA uh, that quote, if the four are, are assassinated, our wrongs are avenged, quote unquote. And quote, there is one man to everyone in the cabinet. Another letter that came into the possession of the Bureau on May 10th, 1865, this would have been uh, roughly uh, a month after the assassination, from a union agent in Paris, quotes from a note written by a Confederate agent identified as Johnston, an obvious alias, in the note. Johnston said that he followed Grant for two days, demonstrating the scope of the conspiracy. He also said that he returned to Washington on April 14th, that was the day of the assassination, and within half an hour knew that, quote, an attack was going to be made that night, and that had the attack been carried out as originally planned, uh, some 15 Yankee leaders would be dead. Johnston also said that Booth would never be taken, that he would bullet himself first thus demonstrating Confederate Underground's familiarity with Booth. This letter, the TIOS letter, and in fact, all letters that came into the possession of the Bureau of Military Justice after the assassination, speak only of assassination. None speaks of kidnapping. The authenticity of these letters has never been successfully challenged. On April 3rd, Seward said to Attorney General James Speed, that man, that quote, if there were to be assassinations, now is the time, unquote. Remember that Seward was privy to all Union intelligence. A displaced Michigander in wartime Richmond wrote that he heard a lot of talk there of uh, plots to assassinate federal leaders. Richmond newspapers encouraged these plots. He wrote further that assassination of Lincoln and his cabinet was talked about in Richmond as a probability, and that by August of 64, the city was caught in an assassination frenzy. Uh, if it was a frenzy in August of 64, could it have been anything less than white hot by the spring of 65? Conversations between Confederate Secret Service operatives in Canada that testified uh, to at the trial of the conspirators, uh, there were dozens of references to assassination, but only one to abduction. Lincoln, his cabinet, Vice President Johnson, Secretary of State Seward, Secretary of War Stanton, Lieutenant General Grant, and Secretary of the Treasury Chase, Judge Advocate General Joseph Holt, former Vice President Hannibal Hamlin, Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells, and even General John Adams Dix were all named as targets or possible targets of assassination. Kidnapping as an object of uh, Booth and his team is a gigantic myth. The conspirator Samuel Arnold, that man, wrote in his memoirs, he confirmed in his memoirs that it was a myth. Judge Advocate uh, John Bingham, that man, and Commissioner Thomas M. Harris, that man, concluded after more than six weeks of uh, testimony from 371 witnesses at the trial of the Lincoln conspirators 
that it was a myth that Booth's object was always assassinations. Conspirator Lewis Powell, that man who came within an inch of murdering Secretary of State William Seward, said to Assistant Secretary of War Thomas Eckert, that man, he said, quote, all I can say about this is that you, meaning federal prosecutors, have not, uh, have not got the one half of them, unquote. Not got the one half? That nine, does that mean the total number of conspirators was more than 18? I submit to you that that is exactly what it means. But Booth told uh, his co-conspirator, David Harrell, that man, that there were 35 involved in the conspiracy. And he told his actor friend from New York, Samuel Knapp Chester, that man, that there were between 50 and 100 involved in the conspiracy. Let, let us grant that 50 to 100 is too high. Secrecy would have been impossible with such a number. Let us settle on a conspiracy that involved between 18 and 35. Could such a number have been necessary to assassinate one man? Could a conspiracy involving such a number have been carried out in Washington, a city saturated with Confederate agents without the knowledge and therefore the approval of the Confederate leadership? Clearly no to both questions. Powell also told Eckert that it was his impression, that's the word he used, it was his impression that arrangements had been made with others for the same disposition of other federal office holders uh, as, uh, as he was to make of Seward. Can we read in that statement anything less than a well-laid plan to destroy the United States government? Or if not a well-laid plan, at least a plan. Henri Beaumont de Saint Marie, who was with John Surratt, there's John Surratt, in Italy, they both joined the papal zouaves, swore in an affidavit he prepared in 1866, addressed to Secretary of State William Seward, that Surratt admitted to him that he and Booth had killed Lincoln. But when he was asked whether Davis was complicit, he answered, Surratt answered, I am not going to tell you, quote unquote. That is as good as an affirmative answer because it means that Surratt knew, otherwise he would have said, I don't know. And that Davis was complicit, otherwise he would have said Davis. No, Davis had nothing to do with it, completely innocent. This answer by Surratt, therefore, to St. Marie's question is in fact a smoking gun. Further, Consider this statement by William A. Tidwell. Tidwell uh, spent his entire life in government intelligence. In his book, April 65, which was published uh, as a solo in 1995, after he wrote uh, Come Retribution with David Gaddy and um, uh, <clears throat> another assassination story, his name just leaves me here for a second. He wrote, what has been established, however, is a net network of documented facts that logically coincide with the information that would have had to exist if Davis did decide to attack the leaders of the federal government. One uh, can refute the logic only by a bizarre, a bizarre distortion of reason. The probability that all of these facts were true and that Davis did not make the critical decision is very slight indeed, unquote. Lastly, consider the fact that the major Confederate figures who were most likely complicit in the events of April 14th, the assassination and the attempted assassinations, including Judah Benjamin, Jacob Thompson, George Sanders, John Surratt, there's Sanders, John Surratt, Benjamin Franklin Stringfellow, there he is, the Confederate agent, and Thomas Harbin, another agent, all fled the country after the assassination, Stringfellow for two years. Thompson for three or four, uh, Harbin for five years, Sanders for seven years, and Benjamin never to return. Surratt came back, was brought back in chains 19 months after the assassination. With respect to the second question, that is whether or not the Confederate leadership was ready, willing, and able to make it happen. The answer is ready and willing, yes, but only partially able. Consider the following. Davis had said in 1862, quote, if it were necessary, he or we had friends enough in the North to destroy the president and every head of the departments, unquote. Two, there are at least a dozen attempts on Lincoln's life during his term, both before and after the Wistar and Dahlgren Kilpatrick raids. Is it likely that all of these were rogue operations or is it more likely that at least some, perhaps most, perhaps all 
were carried out with the knowledge and approval of the Confederate leadership. Recall that part of the Northwest conspiracy orchestrated by Seddon, Thompson, and Hines in 1864 contemplated the assassination of Governors John Bruff of Ohio, Oliver P. Morton of Indiana, Richard Yates of Illinois, as well as federal state municipal officials who stood in the way. Inasmuch as Hines answered to Thompson, Thompson to Seddon, and Seddon to Davis, Davis and therefore Benjamin must have known and approved of the conspiracy and therefore of the assassinations. Uh, if they signed off on these assassinations, that is assassinations of political leaders whose contribution to their losses was meager. And when the Confederacy was still in the game, albeit not by much, why would they not sign off on assassination of union leaders whose contribution to their losses was major? And when the Confederacy's back was to the wall uh, and when the resources were all but exhausted. Blackburn's yellow fever plot and Davis's knowledge of it is another smoking gun. Proof positive, not evidence, but proof positive that as, that as early as the summer of 64, if not earlier, the Confederate government and its Secret Service Bureau were actively plotting the murder of Abraham Lincoln because of the perceived license granted by the raids on Richmond. Let us make no mistake about this. This is critical. These three men, Holcomb, Thompson, and Clay, were Davis's men. They were Davis's appointees. They were sent to Canada by Davis. They were charged by Davis with responsibility for carrying out verbal orders and instructions given to them by Davis. They were financed by Davis. They were subject to recall by Davis. These were the men who counseled Hyams as to how to spread pestilence in the North and assassinate Lincoln by infecting him with yellow fever. Are we to assume that the Confederate leadership was ready and willing, if not quite able to assassinate Lincoln in the summer of 64, uh, but changed its collective mind in the spring of 65, despite a white hot assassination frenzy, frenzy in Richmond and a Southern press banged with the blood of union leaders. Is this a plausible thesis? Before answering that question, recall that the Confederate leadership changed its enciphering key in February of 1865 from complete victory to come retribution. Does that sound like they were going to fold their tents peacefully? accept the verdict of history peacefully, calmly, quietly? Categorically, no. It sounds like they were determined to have their pound of flesh and they would have it. Booth and his team were not the Confederacy's only entry into the killing game. George Atzerodt in his May 1st, 1865, there he is, confession, spoke of conspirators who were active in New York City. In addition, Thomas F. Harney, an explosives expert with the Secret Service's Tor Torpedo Bureau, led a team whose purpose it was to infiltrate Washington and assassinate Lincoln and as many other federal office holders as possible, including cabinet members, blowing up part of the White House by blowing up part of the White House. That's how they were going to accomplish it. Further, John Surratt, in an 1870 lecture he gave in Rockville, Maryland, spoke of another conspiracy in Washington the conspiracy quote that we all knew about, unquote. Harney's miss mission, which failed when he and a few of his men were captured as they neared Washington, receives corroboration from Atzerat, who mentioned it in his May 1st, 1865 confession. Between Richmond and Washington, Harney was aided every step of the way by trainmen, post commanders, guides, other agents, and the great ghost himself, John Mosby. Is it even possible that Harney undertook such a mission for the purpose of multiple assassinations with all that help without the knowledge and approval of Davis and Benjamin? No, it is not. With respect to the third question, that is whether or not Confederate leaders had sufficient motivation to make the events of April 14th happen, the answer is most decidedly yes. Consider the following. One, gratuitous, the gratuitous burning of Atlanta and Columbia and the wanton destruction and plunder in Georgia and the Shenandoah Valley were sufficient in themselves for the Confederate leaders to want the authors of these deeds dead as condign punishment and also incidentally to deprive them of the sweetness of victory. Confederate leaders believed that Lincoln had ordered the assassinations of Davis and his cabinet as part of the raids on Richmond, that the orders doubtless were doubtless concurred in by Johnson, Stanton, Seward, and Grant 
and that gave them license to respond in kind. Retribution in kind for orders to assassinate incident to the raids was demanded by much of the Southern press, a pressure that Confederate leaders had to be sensitive to. The execution of John Yates Bell added to the hatred of Confederate leaders uh, for Lincoln and his administration. Lastly, the, catastro the catastrophe that Confederate leaders uh, and uh, most Southerners had fought bravely and tenaciously for four years to avert was now upon them. The catastrophe may be identified as one, the loss of their political independence, two, the loss of their property and wealth, three, the loss of their lifestyle and culture, four, the social upheaval attendant to the integration of four million suddenly free slaves into a society of five and a half million whites, and five, the quote, mongrelization, unquote, of their race. Blame for this catastrophe was placed entirely on Lincoln and his administration, particularly the most prominent members, that is Lincoln, Johnson, Seward, Stanton, and Grant, the very five whom Confederate operatives attempted to assassinate that night. In conclusion, it is obvious to me, and I hope to you, that the assassination of Lincoln and the attempted assassinations of Johnson, Seward, Stanton, and Grant, at least, and perhaps as many as 10 others, on the night of April 14, 1865, was a continuation of the Black Flag warfare that had characterized our war from its inception, an elevation of degree, not of kind. It was orchestrated and financed by the Confederate government and its Secret Service Bureau and their supporters. It was most certainly not one mad act by a half mad actor. It was rather a last ditch attempt to snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. It was a desperate enterprise to be sure, but desperate men do desperate things and prefer a long shot to no shot at all. Thank you very much. Now, if I may just put in a little plug, I have published a book called Decapitating the Union, Jefferson Davis, Judah Benjamin, and the plot to assassinate Lincoln. It is available, it's been, it has received wonderful reviews. There are 62 reviews at the Amazon entry, 57 of which give it five stars. It is available from uh, Amazon and other on, online uh, booksellers, and also available in just about every bookstore in the country. Uh, it sells for $24.95. So I, I hope you'll buy copies. I, and uh, it pretty much says everything I've just said except that it says it in the almost 400 pages, 372 pages rather than whatever this is, 48. Okay, so thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it greatly.